Hello everyone and uh, welcome to my Clip Studio Paint Pro animation tutorial. Um, as you can see on screen, uh, here's my animated illustration. Um, it's a girl, anime girl, doing some cool basketball dribbles. Uh, this was inspired by um, this one video I saw of James Harden uh, pre-game. He was just chilling on the bench and he was just doing a bunch of cool dribbles, just seated, and I was like, wow. What if that was an anime girl doing that? And now, here it is. In all its glory. Well, anyways, uh, let's get started with uh, this little teaching. So the first thing you do is you click File, then New, and then it'll prompt this uh, tab to open up. Uh, you just click on the Animation tab under Use of Work at the very top. And then you can set your pixel size, your canvas size and pixel resolution and whatever. And you can also set the amount of blank space on the side, which is useful when if you have any camera moves or anything like that. And um, finally, at the bottom or the center, there's a timeline. Uh, the main thing to look at is the frame rate, which is currently set to 24 frames per second, but no worries about it. Uh, as you're working, you can just change the frame rate at any point your heart desires. Uh, you can change it to any frame rate, and it's extremely simple. You just tap on the animation tab, you go down to the timeline, and then you'll see change frame rate. And when you click on that, you can just change your frame rate to anything you want. So after all that, you just press OK, and you'll be greeted with this interface. I'm sure you've seen plenty of times before. Um, at the bottom, you can see this timeline. Um, if you don't have it, all you got to do is head up to the top or the Windows tab, tap that, scroll down a bit, and you'll see that timeline. And just click that, and you can have your timeline to do all your animation biddings. Well, here is my project, what I started off with. It's a very nice illustration. She's just sitting there, nothing's happening. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you click on that new animation folder and you select the drawing that you have already and what you do then is you click new cell and you can't just paste the drawing directly into this animation folder it doesn't really register it as a drawing yet so you kind of have to paste it there and then go over to your layers and rename that new pasted layer as the same name as the first cell in your animation folder. Then you just delete that animation cell and it will register this as the first cell. I mean, to be honest, it's kind of a hassle, but I mean, if you just do it a few times, you get used to it really quickly. So after you do that, you just click on that onion skin and you click on new cell and now you can just hack away just anything you want anything you wish just draw whatever so now i'm just going to speed up my whole animation process and you can watch it in the background um, you can just see my whole process from start to finish uh, i'll i'll talk a bit over it um, and when i don't have much to say i'll just cue the music I mean, it's probably already playing in the background, but uh, you can just watch what I'm doing. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I am creating the keyframes, which are the most important frames of the drawing. Um, I have decided at this point that the most important drawings is uh, when the ball is in the right hand and then sends it to the ground, so the ground is the second keyframe. Then it bounces up to the left hand, which is the third keyframe, pushes it down, hits the ground again, so on and so forth. So these are the main drawings, and 
The movements in between are, I mean, of less importance, to just put it that way. Another thing uh, to be noted is that before you start animating, I think it's always a great idea to have your character um, drawn out a few times, like just draw out the character design. Uh, I never used to do that with my illustrations, but I've realized with animation, because of how much you have to understand the volumes of this character, it, it makes a lot more sense to have a character design before you start. It could be something very simple, which I can show right, right on screen right now. Um, it's not a whole lot, but I think you should really think about what the character looks like in a neutral pose before you start animating. So a few things that I like doing when I'm animating is that I like to um, just draw in the head later, like after the body, because I like having the head kind of act as a secondary movement to the body. Um, so the head's positioning is highly dependent on where the torso is. And that torso is highly dependent on where the feet are. Well, and also the feet is highly dependent on where the hands are, and the hands are highly dependent on where the ball is. So what I'm doing is I animate the ball first, um, and then based off that positioning, I know where the hands are. And once I know where the hands are, where the ball is, I can put where the feet are as it's like doing these cool dribbles and stuff. And after I have a solid understanding of where the legs are, do I finally move up to drawing the torso? And after I draw the torso, then I finally move up to the head, and then I move up to the hair. So there's this whole chain of um, just moving components that I feel like are highly dependent on each other. And you can just, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier if you know what comes before it to animate what you're animating. I have no idea what music you're listening to right now, but I hope it's good. I have not chosen it yet at the point of me recording my audio. Um, I hope it is enjoyable. So as you're animating, there's a few things that you should really be focused on. Um, one of them is just the weights, like really feel the weights. Like for example, right now I'm kind of having a bit of a struggle drawing the hands as it contacts the ball because I really want it to feel believable as a ball bounces up into the hand. You know, there's a bit of a knockback and when it sends it off, you know, the hand also, the arm has a bit of a drag because it's pushing this weight. And um, all these things you should really think about. And you should really act it out as well. Like, one thing I really like doing is as I'm animating, I kind of move what the character is moving. Um, for example, later on, you'll see the head doing this weird bob. Like, that that's just how my neck moves. I, I do a little... I'm, I'm kind of like an ostrich, you know, and you'll see that reflected in the character, and it's because as I'm animating, like, I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, shimmy that, shimmy that, you know, and I'm moving my head around and giving it a good, some good neck grease, you know what I mean? So, um, it's always good to act it out a bit. Um, it's even better if you act it out and record yourself. Um, personally, I did not feel like that was necessary for 
this animation. Um, for me, this felt like something that was relatively straightforward. Um, but if you're tackling something that you've never done before, it's always useful to have some video reference. So one thing about animating that is a bit different from illustration is that, um, you know, you have to think about the animation as its whole entirety instead of just being this singular still frame. Um, as you can see, we, we are quite far into this time lapse, but I, I do not have a finished frame yet. Or, I only have one, it's the very first frame that I started with. And, um, that's because, like, a lot of the movements are dependent on each other, as I've said before. So, I have to animate things one at a time, and you don't really just want to jump in and finish everything at once. Another thing is, I don't know if you guys noticed, I definitely did not notice as I'm talking. And um, it is that my original frame that I started with, I have changed because that frame did not loop well. So I've changed it into a position that loops a lot better. Um, that way, uh, when it cycles back around, it, it doesn't look like it's jerking around or anything like that. And another little tip I have for having this animation loop a bit better is if you go to the very end of your animation or just beyond that 24 frames you can actually go to the 25th or 26 or whatever whatever frame but it just happens to not be viewable in the display but what this is useful for is that you can have your first drawing pasted onto the 25th cell in the timeline using the method I showed at the very beginning and then with the onion skin on you can see where you have to have your animation end up again and it's very useful to have that um, it just makes it so much easier to have it loop seamlessly so what you can see I'm doing right now is I am uh, drawing in the details and I'm just shifting it around that that sock you see there yeah, that I'm just constantly moving it. You'll see it more later on, but I'm just shifting it up and down the leg, left and right, um, changing the perspective on it, and it's just so that as the animation moves, the socks look like they're actually in the same spot. Because, you know, it's really easy to have the consistency fall apart. Beyond that, um, as the ball's bouncing around, uh, when the foreground leg kind of hides behind the ball, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's some funky frames in there. I mean, but that's the beauty of animation. Unless if you really stop on that frame, you won't notice that broken ankle. But um, it's there, and I did it so that it can clear the floor and the ball, um, even though it kind of doesn't really work that well with that leg, that knee joint, like it physically can't bend that far, but you know, with a little bit of cheating and breaking bones, I got it to go around and I, I think it's pretty hard to notice it. So right now I'm animating um, the shoulder movements and stuff and I'm having a bit of trouble because I'm trying to decide how the arm is. As I'm doing my fake little dribbles acting out uh, the character's movements, um, I was contemplating if 
my shoulder dips down to catch the ball, or does it dip down to send the ball off? Which, um, I was trying both in this recording. Uh, I tried it dipping down and then dipping up, and that's why you see me just here just struggling a bit. Uh, I was trying to see which one just looks better, and I ended up deciding that um, it makes a bit more sense to dip down when catching the ball. As you're animating, just always remember to scrub. Just keep on scrubbing up and down that animation. You really gotta see how everything lines up. Um, if you don't move up and down the animation enough, it, it's really easy to just lose sight of um, the position of things. So um, that's also why I like to work with individual elements one at a time. like. I just do the cuff, just the cuff, and I go through and do all the cuffs. Um, and that's so that it's a lot easier to keep track of where this cuff is. And um, I've already decided where the shoulder is going to be, so um, it's just the cuff, right? Yeah, this is what I mentioned before. I start um, moving and editing that tube sock um, just to make sure it isn't dancing around oh yeah here's a little trick I did um, uh, I flipped the canvas which uh, you can set the hotkey for just I'm, I'm sure you guys flipped the canvas already but it's it's very helpful when you're drawing something that you're in an angle you're not used to. I don't often draw the face facing the right side. So by flipping it around to have it facing the left side, it makes it a lot easier for me to draw this face and keep it consistent. And I feel like that's one of the things that has to be very consistent, uh, the face, because most people are just looking at that face. And um, if it's it's a bit funky, everyone everyone's gonna notice. So what I did there was um, I am tracing the head over and over, and it's kind of just in the same place. And then after I've traced it a bunch of times, I'm editing and moving the head afterwards. This makes it a lot easier to have very consistent. Uh, features um, especially for like something like the head um, one way to make this a lot easier is I've created a separate animation folder for the head because I've deemed it as like what I said earlier it's it's a secondary action to the body so it ma just made sense for me to have it in a different folder um, but also by doing that, when I'm selecting, it's no longer clipping into, like, the shoulders and stuff, so it's, there's no hassle in moving the head around a bit. I like to draw the head's movement first, um, before I start, um, connecting the head to the torso. And I find it so that, like, that that's a bit easier when the head's already completely moved, independent to the torso. Well, not independent, but just um, flowing in a way that fits the movement of the body, even though it's not completely in line with the body. So when you do that, uh, afterwards, I just connect the two points, uh, head to the uh, to the to the torso to create the neck, and um, I find that the simplest way for me. Some people like to animate the necks first, I mean, that's just kind of weird, but that is a way of going about things. 
So here I've had uh, her neck move a bit too much like an ostrich. Like I mentioned earlier, I kind of move like an ostrich. So I did oversell that head movement. So I'm just going back and tweaking it a little bit. Um, just always remember, there's never any harm done in just messing up a bit. I don't think you ever should just go like, oh, that's whatever, that's good enough. You should always try to have it look the best. And I feel like that's something I've actually learned recently, even though I've been drawing for many years now. Um, not to say I'm anywhere near like a true pro or anything, I'm just a student. But um, I think it's a mentality that you should have. Just um, when you mess up, just fix it. Like, even if it takes a lot of time, why does it matter? Like you're learning something out of this. Each of these times that you fix it, you just learn, oh, I shouldn't do this next time. And us all being students, um, no matter what part of your life you're in, we're all students. So we should always just be learning something. Hopefully by the time we're working, um, I'm saying this in the context of a, a younger audience, but uh, it's it's a lot more beneficial when we just know, like, if we've gone through all the trials and tribulations early on, we don't need to make these mistakes as we're working and then get, like, a pay cut or something because the boss is like, hey, why is the animation, like, four days late? And then you're just like, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. Like, it's so hard to correct something or, you know, whatever. But, yeah, this don't be afraid of correcting your mistakes. So now we're finally starting the coloring phase. Um, I think this is very straightforward and very much so like um, just the character design and the shapes and volumes and things like that. Your colors should also be predetermined. Um, if you're trying to decide on your colors as you're paint bucketing in hundreds of frames, well in this case it's just 24, but it, it gets really tiring if you just want to change the color. Um, you just gotta refill in all those frames you just did. Uh, and also, every time you use the paint bucket tool, it kind of overfills it a little bit. So you start having like frayed edges and things like that. So it just makes a lot more sense to have the colors preset already. Uh, I've done that and um, I'm just eye droppering the colors off of my um, reference uh design and i'm just applying that to the animation i do all my coloring on one layer because i find it the easiest um as you start building up this um color layer uh because of the previous lines you've had for different body parts and different uh little trinkets of the character um all these lines build up and sometimes you don't even have to outline uh, the body part anymore because it's it's in between a bunch of other um, parts of the body and that just so all you got to do now is just paint bucket it and it just fills in another thing great about coloring is that um, a lot of the times 
like when your drawings are in black and white um sometimes like some irregular movements get overlooked um like you'll see very shortly the basketball i have here is a bit wonky donkey um especially when it bounces back up into the left hand of the player uh it kind of just sticks to the hand for three or four frames and um i never would have noticed that if i didn't color it in and after coloring it in i'm like wow how did i not notice this jarring problem and it's just because before it was so well camouflaged but now with the contrast of the ball it's like it's obvious so that's one of the good things about coloring um, aside from making the whole thing look better um, it also helps weed out some mistakes you made earlier on Well, there you have it. That's my anime basketball player. Um, there's two main things I wanted to accomplish with this uh, tutorial. The first is how to set up an animation workspace in Clip Studio Paint. And the second one is um, to show that Clip Studio Paint is a very valid animation software. Um, I feel like a lot of the people watching this are probably coming from an illustration background and already have access to uh, Clip Studio Paint Pro or EX or whatever. Um, and I feel like this software is very, very well designed for animation. Um, as you can see, I created this. And the cool part is, it has some cool brushes that a lot of other softwares do not have. And you can also easily make your backgrounds in here. It's It seems like it's at least, the very least, a very solid introduction to animation. And I'm hoping that you guys, after watching this, will also on your own attempt to animate a bit more than what is commonly shown on the website of just a blink or you know some smoke coming off of like a cup of latte or some color shimmers or something i i just i hope you give a shot at a full animated scene or a full animated action um because of the 24 frame limitation but uh i hope this brought you something and have a great day